Dan Grams, the president, Grams of Capital Management. Good morning, Dan. Thanks for joining us this final day of the week. Well, it's great to be with you, Alex. Great to have you on the show as always, Dan. So I was wondering, um, in terms of three major indices, what are the levels that, are, that you are observing for today? Well, today is an interesting day. As you pointed out, it's Friday. And it tells us something about the attitude of the people who came into the market yesterday. The way I look at this, yesterday we saw buyers coming back into the market. Now the issue is, do we see confidence? Are buyers willing to hold on to positions going into the weekend? Or do they take profit? Or was what we saw yesterday sellers buying to take profits. I think today will give us some answers and what we're looking for in the S&P for example, ideally you'd want to see that market closing above uh, 4530 to 40. Uh, we're a little bit away from that right now. In the uh, NASDAQ market, you'd want to see 14,850. In the Dow, 34,800. In the Russell, uh, 21 even would be the next reference you'd want to see to the upside closes in those areas, those ranges, I think would be a sign of confidence. If on the other hand, we make new lows from where we are right now in these markets, and then that would tell us that we don't see that confidence and that we it would imply a down day for Monday, not necessarily a big day down, but we look for softer markets on Monday's action. So it's an interesting setup, and the next few hours will give us some answers to those questions. You know what's also interesting to me, uh, the bond market in the U.S., also in Europe, of course, but what we are seeing in the U.S. are new two-year fresh highs in terms of the 10-year treasury yield, and of course, the dollar index. So let me just kick off very quickly with the bond market. What do you think is, is, it, is it suggesting? Well, I think right now we're seeing a bit of a few things. One what is the concern of the marketplace you know we're seeing prices on the yield curve going down as yields go up a bit and i think it's a function of two things one as the prices go down in the yield curve the two year to 10 to 30 uh, that money is going someplace as we see prices going lower in my opinion that money one of the places it goes to is it goes to risk on trades which means it goes to the stock market so i think that's one factor the other thing that we have to i think take into consideration here is the setup the um, obvious plan that the central bank the federal reserve in the united states is contemplating we've had a number uh, of people now saying from the fed that well 50 basis points increase is what we need to do. We need to get more aggressive against inflation. And because some people feel they're lagging way behind in terms of trying to control inflation. Now, 50 basis points is not the typical change that we see from the Fed. It's usually 25 basis points. But, you know, they have gone as high as 75 basis points within the last 20 years, 2007, if I remember correctly. So seeing that kind of movement from the Fed, they're telegraphing it. They're setting the market up. So if they did less, what, was, what would that mean if they did less than 50? Well, maybe the market's not as strong as, as they contemplated. Maybe there are other economic issues at play. So since they're setting the stage for 50, the expectation now for the market and will be priced into the market, I think would be a 50 basis point increase. Whether they need to do that or not, I think that's debatable. Uh, but the fact is they need to try to do something to get a grip on inflation. Not an easy job. No, no, that's for sure. I, I think it's a, it's a very, very challenging job, that's for sure. But they could have also uh, probably imagined that something similar could have happened considering also the extremely expensive fiscal 
uh, policies in the past two to three years in the US. Uh, so uh, certainly another asset class in my opinion extremely interesting is the dollar index. Um, so, so do you think that um, after the announcement that for example Saudi Arabia might um, accept petro yuans which means payments for, for crude oil in yuan and on the other side Russia said that uh, when it comes to Europeans they will, would not accept dollars and euros for uh, for the European gas um, deliveries. I was wondering do you think that this might have any kind of impact on dollar index in the future? I, I think right now it's mixed. Uh, we don't know. You know and there's also discussions that I've seen that Russia is contemplating accepting Bitcoin as payment. Uh, you know crude oil payment and other currencies have occurred in the past. Japan, India, if you look at their history on purchases, they have purchased in other currencies. The dominant uh, uh, medium of exchange is the U.S. dollar. You know, that still represents about 80% of all uh, currency transactions. So I don't know how much of a dramatic impact it has in terms of the actual dollars that we're looking at compared to the entire marketplace. The currency market is so huge that even though I'm not discounting you know, Russia's payment, if you, if you look at when crude oil was $70 a barrel, Russia made $120 billion. So, you know, their income streams are really critical to them right now, and they want to maintain them. And how much of a threat that is, here's what I don't understand about that. Once you say that, you want to take another currency. What does that mean? It means all the currency, all the current supply contracts have to be renegotiated. That is not a term that's probably in any of those contracts accepting other currencies. So that opens those contracts up for negotiation. And that also means the terms and conditions can change and it may not be favorable for Russia. And it also means it takes time to do that. Now Putin has given, you know, Gazprom and the central bank a week to accomplish this currency issue. I don't think that's possible. I don't see how that can be done no matter how hard they try. And are the other countries willing to do that? You you know, Alex, what's interesting too, when we think about this dependency right now of energy from Russia to Europe. Uh, you know, we've seen the Fed, or excuse me, the U.S. now is contemplating 15 uh, billion metric, uh, cubic uh, metric of uh, LNG going to uh, the yeah. EU. So they're easing, right? They're easing some of that dependence in that regard. And, you know, Europe wants to get off of two thirds of their dependence on Russian energy by the end of this year and totally by 2027. So there's a plan in place. Uh, Russia, though, at the same time, is contemplating establishing another pipeline to China. Uh, they're looking for other outlets for their product because their days may be numbered when it comes to supplying Europe. Yeah, on the other side, um, if we have to be honest, Dan, of course, these 15 billion cubic meters, we were discussing this story, which is a major story, this deal between the US and the EU, but it's 15 billion cubic meters is not enough. I mean, it's not sufficient to cover the entire Eurozone. It might cover the, 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 the few months, probably a quarter of necessities of a single country, but not you know, the entire uh, Eurozone. So, so the dependency on Russia is still, how can I say, um, is still here with us and it is going to be for, for the following at least 12 to 24 months if we have to be realistic, despite, of course, the efforts which are extremely positive to, to, to change this. Yeah, I totally agree. It, 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 it shows intention, but it's not the reality of changing the dependency uh, situation right now. That, that isn't changing. One of the things that Russia has come out and said is that the gas uh, pipeline through the Ukraine is still functioning. And you know, that represents about a billion dollars of revenue for Ukraine. Now, what would happen, and I'm not contemplating, and I hope it doesn't, uh, 
if there's a, an attack on that pipeline, maybe even unintentional. What happens right. if that gets disrupted? It, it's it's still a very tenuous situation there. Right. Uh, final take, um, Dan, on crude oil. I was wondering, what are the levels that you're observing for the final trading session of the week? Well, you know, right now we're seeing it back off a bit. But what you want to pay attention to is that 110 even down to 109.50. Uh, we found buyers at those levels before. So the issue, I think, is do we close below that today? <clears throat> Excuse me. Or do we see buyers coming back in? In other words, do people want to go home short crude oil into the weekend? Uh, with all this crazy situation going on, do you want to be on that side? So I would expect a bounce if we get down towards those levels. And closing above 110, I, I would not be surprised to see that kind of action uh, in crude right now. Thank you very much, as always. Dan Kramza, President Kramza Capital Management. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Alex. You too.